thank you, Professor Hare. That was uh, excellent information, um, lots to learn there. And we will turn to our, our second speaker now. Uh, our second speaker is Professor Alistair Gibb. He's led research teams in construction innovation, safety and health for more than 28 years, leading work on the interaction between these two domains. He has led projects on nanotechnology, 3D concrete printing, offsite construction, platform technology, transformational health and safety, accident causality, and COVID-19. Professor Gibbs' presentation will build on Professor Hare's, highlighting current learning from the UK's construction design and management regulations. He will draw on his 30-year experience in the US context of implementing PTD without the legislative driver that is present in the UK. Please go ahead and roll the video. Hello, my name is Alistair Gibb. I'm Emeritus Professor of Construction Engineering Management at Loughborough University in the UK. Thank you for this invitation to give a keynote presentation on prevention through design impact on the UK construction industry. What I intend to cover is PTD, a timeline for the UK, and also the interaction with the US. The PTD impact in the UK itself, briefly, other factors that are affecting the impact, including exploiting the digital revolution, and then PTD beyond CDM, designing for end users. So first of all, a timeline, a PTD timeline for you, for the UK in terms of legislation. These are the key dates. In the early 1990s, there was a European directive, Temporary Mobile Construction Sites Directive, required all European states to implement legislation for prevention through design. That became CDM 94 in 1995, revised in 2007, revised in 2015. And I've been privileged to be able to uh, see the development of that. I became an academic round about the same time as that directive came out and then have been able to see and watch that, uh, that development over time. Now, there are some challenges, therefore, uh, with this uh, legislation. But what it was really saying was it, CDM is to force designers to consider the health and safety of construction workers. That was the focus and that was very different to what had happened before and also that's very different to what happens typically in the usa because architects and design engineers previously had said construction workers nothing to do with us that's a contractor issue cdm of course changed that and that was one of the biggest uh, differences that occurred through cdm but there's another impact here as well and it's to do with the word design what do we mean by design. Now, I've spent a lot of time in my um, academic career working with um, er ergonomics people, human factors experts, and so forth. Their definition of design is here the application of psychological and physiological principles to the engineering and design of products, processes, and systems. Now, that is a much broader definition than what we tend to, to use in the built environment because we talk about design as as what architects do what design engineers do sitting in a drawing board or more likely at a, at a computer but nevertheless the design of the permanent works and maybe the design also of temporary works whereas the ergonomics definition includes design in a much broader sense so it would include tasks like deciding what the job should be what the sequence should be what the time scale, the schedule should be. Um, and all of those aspects, the resources involved and so forth, are all part of design according to the human factors approach. So too are RAMs, risk assessments and method statements. They're all things that are done before the spade is dug in the ground, as it were. And that's a challenge for us as we talk about prevention through design to make sure we understand that we're talking about the same definition of design. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but they are different. So going back to that timeline, the other thing I've been privileged to be able to do is be involved to some extent with what's been going on in the US um, over that period since around about 2000. We had a design conference where um, uh, the US academics and industrialists were involved. 
I then went over to Chicago, got involved in Oregon in 2003-2007. This book was an outcome uh, of the 2003 conference. Um, again, acknowledge um, particularly Steve Hecker and John Gambatiz, uh, who some of you will know. Um, and then again in Minneapolis, and then in 2008, NIOSH funded John Gambatiz to come over to the UK and uh, try and draw some lessons for what we were learning from our regulations. And here we are now uh, in Arizona in 2022. So a lot of that learning has been bilateral, as it were, has been between the UK and the USA going both ways. And therefore, it's important that we do look to, you know, can we compare the UK and the USA? Well, this is often said, isn't it, about our two countries? We're, we're the same, but we're different. We have the same language. Well, not really. We have the same culture in some ways, but there are lots of differences as well. And as far as PTD is concerned, one of the biggest differences is to do with legislation. We have laws that require designers to consider prevention through design for construction workers, the CDM regulations. That's something you don't have in the USA and therefore your situation is different. You do, I would argue, have a moral imperative nonetheless. But of course, moral imperatives, as this cartoon suggests, aren't necessarily effective. Yes, we can do something, but we probably won't. And of course, there are also business imperatives as well. I would argue that thinking about construction during the design phase will make construction cheaper, more cost effective, uh, more productive and so forth. But, you know, they're all sort of built into the way we do business rather than a law that can be uh, uh, sort of enforced. So looking back at the UK, then the impact of PTD in the UK. These are the data from uh, the early 1980s, more or less when I started work, through to just before the COVID pandemic. And you can see there's a reduction from uh, almost 10, really, when I was in my early career as an engineer and site manager, through to about two per 100,000 workers now. There's been a plateauing off over the last decade or so. But you can see here also, and this, these are construction statistics, that top line is, where CDM comes in, in, in the mid-1990s, you have had a reduction from around about five to two per 100,000. So that seems to be rather clear. Just a shout out for my friend and, uh, and colleague, um, Professor Billy Hare, who's also talking about the UK experience of PTD, and he will be saying more about uh, the CDM regulations and how they are implemented. But back to that impact about the UK, back to that impact. Well, it's not that simple, is it? We can't really just say CDM came in here, it's now two instead of five, and therefore CDM has, has brought that about. Those of us who are academics here know that correlation does not imply causation. We can't make that direct uh, link. It's also not that simple because there have been new theories and strategies that have occurred at the same time. The way we manage safety and health now is different to the way we managed it two or three decades ago. Sidney Decker and Eric Holmagel have been leaders in that sort of field of challenging the health and safety strategies and sort of culture that we've had. Don't tell them what to do, ask them what they need. People are the solution, not the problem. And to a greater or lesser extent, organisations in the UK have adopted some of these approaches and changed the way that they manage the process. It's also not that simple for other reasons as well. One of the biggest changes, I think, has been the digital revolution. When I was working as an engineer and manager, I never used a computer. I'd never touched a computer. I had no reason to. Why would I? So when I finished and became an academic in 1993, that was the first time I'd used a computer. They were there, of course, but in the back rooms. They weren't um, site-wide uh, and they weren't uh, affecting our lives in quite the same way. So that revolution has occurred. And of course, in many ways, it's been really positive in terms of clash detection, in terms of, uh, of buildability, constructability. Lots of benefits there. Building the building or the facility in the computer before you build it on site has been a good thing. 
And that's also included health and safety. We've perhaps been a little bit slow on uptake, but it has happened. Initially, some of those first ideas were you press a button and it, and it puts handrails in. Well, hey, you know, that's fine, but it's not rocket science, is it? But now it's starting to change where we really are trying to integrate health and safety um, uh, thoughts and, and strategies into the building information models, into the digital twins. As long as you don't follow some of the practices on this slide, then maybe that's a good thing. And in some ways, you know, it's a no brainer, isn't it? That, that if you have that construction ex expertise at uh, design phase, you would expect it to be better. You'd expect it to be more cost effective. You would expect uh, the outcomes uh, to be more what you would desire. So still exploiting the digital revolution, some colleagues of mine um, are um, running an initiative called the BIM for OSH Observatory, Building Information Modeling for Occupational Safety and Health. An observatory which is seeking to um, pull things together, both in the BIM domain and in the health and safety uh, domain. It's a joint venture with uh, Loughborough in the UK uh, and some IT professionals and business organizations, industry organizations, and their equivalents in Portugal. So it's an exciting opportunity. And, and being Europe wide, we, we've been able to um, draw from some of the lessons from some of the big projects and some of the smaller projects. And that's what the team's seeking to do, to bring together uh, that learning so that people can uh, take the lessons and implement them in their own projects. And of course, being across Europe, it's important that they also consider what the different states are doing. So like the US, where you have state-based legislation as well as federal leg legislation, so too in Europe, we have sovereign states who make the legislation based on EU directives. And in UK's case, we're no longer in the EU, but we're still influenced by these things. Um, but it's important that we also learn from the different ways that they have been implemented. So if you're interested in the BIM for OSH Observatory, let me know or contact my colleague Paul Fuller uh, his email address is there. But the last sort of main point I want to make is, is PTD beyond CDM, PTT beyond, PTD beyond CDM. This is a picture of a disaster, of a bad fire. This is Grenfell, Grenfell Tower in London. Mid-rise building, not tall by US standards, not even tall really by UK standards nowadays. But it's a residential block built in the 1960s that wasn't fit for purpose. It didn't look nice. It wasn't performing very well. Its environmental credentials weren't very good and so forth. So, hey, let's put a jacket on it. Let's let's over clad it. The sad reality is the cladding was flammable as it was put on the building. And also it wasn't put on very well. It wasn't designed very well. The tests were dubious, to say the least and a small fire which should have been able to be contained within the flat in which it occurred went through the whole building 72 people died horrific accident that's a lot of people in a uk context a lot of people anywhere i guess um but certainly uh, it hit the headlines it still hits the headlines there's still fallout from it even now this was 2017 and uh, it's made changes to the way that the fire service works. It's made changes to the way in which things are, are, are designed, the way they're built, challenge the industry and so forth. And a lot of the um, implications are still to be worked out. And one of the things that came out of that was new legislation. Draft building safety bill is what this um, slide shows. And of course, more up to date. Um, is this that now this safety bill has now become law at the back end of April. So up to up to date news there. And what this legislation does is it forces all parties to consider the health and safety of occupants and building users. So all parties involved have to think about the end use of the building. Now, I said before that CDM forced designers to consider the health and safety of construction workers, and that was a big deal. What's happening here is that the building safety um, legislation is saying, OK, similar to CDM, but now you've really got to focus on the end use, on the building occupants, on the building users and so forth. Now, 
that has an impact on designers and we'll come to that shortly but it has a massive massive impact on contractors and the need for contractors to actually think about what are they doing that might affect the long-term safety of this building and again it's mixing um, the uh, up the the way in which we design these things the way in which we build them and it's presenting a big challenge for us in the UK at the moment and will continue to do so for a number of years to come this is a picture to remind me just to say there's nothing new under the sun and, and of course that's true here's a quote from the Bible the Jewish scriptures and there are similar quotes um, with other ancient religions as well so this is 1400 years before Christ several thousand years um, ago Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 8 when you build a new house make a parapet around your roof so that you may not bring the guilt of bloodshed on your house if someone falls from the roof so even all that many many years ago the people who commission building works the people who design them the people who build them the people who operate them had a responsibility to the people that use them that's not new and there have been various other um, examples through through the uh, the centuries that have emphasized that so in that sense it's it's not new so what has changed in terms of the design aspect I mentioned before this is a major challenge for contractors but what has changed as far as the design aspect well one of the key factors is this it's called the golden thread you might have come across that expression before but the idea is that there's this golden thread through the whole process from very early strategic definition through construction handover and use and the idea is that you you need to identify the safety critical aspects of the building or the facility that will affect the end users that might be to do with fire it might be to do with structural collapse or, or whatever and at each um, gateway you need to make sure that the changes you've made the things you've done have not reduced that initial concept that initial acknowledgement of the risk and ways of mitigating that risk so all the way through you need to come back to that and say have we made any choices have we changed the type of overcladding from one type to another type is that more flammable that was one of the issues have we correctly specified the the uh, uh, the work for fire breaks and so forth they were other things that went wrong in Grenfell so all of these things now have to be explicit and explicitly followed through at each gateway between these these parts of the design build and occupation of buildings the golden thread and it's going to be a challenge it's going to be a challenge for, across industry there's help out there we've now got things that we call publicly available specification PASs they used to be called approved codes of practice they go alongside the legislation and explain um, uh, the, the way that things can be uh, can be implemented and they're there to help people uh, do so one of the big challenges of course is that Grenfell was a high-rise residential building but this legislation doesn't just apply to high-rise residential buildings it applies to all buildings and, and all facilities anything that comes under the building regulations and therefore it's going to have an impact across the industry and I personally believe it will be a number of years down the road before this actually has any real impact in parts of the uh, of the industry that, that don't understand the sort of Grenfell challenges that were there so just as we come uh, towards the end of this uh, presentation just to summarize a few key points a few takeaway points in the UK we have regulations to do with prevention through design and therefore it's not just a moral imperative or business driver for us we have the regulations and that does make it easier for us it also ties our hands in other ways you might argue but um, that's something we need to acknowledge there has been an improvement in health and safety since our regulations were implemented and how they've developed over the years since the mid 1990s but as well as CDM the PTD legislation other things have changed as well we need to make sure that we acknowledge that and don't just try and pin anything everything on uh, on PTD for instance we need also to challenge our view of design and make sure that we're not um, we're at least understanding the different way, ways people are using the term design so that we understand what impact non-traditional designers let's call them 
in the construction sense, what impact they can have as well. We need to exploit the digital revolution. We need to make more of it so that health and safety really are an integral part of that digital revolution. And the final point there is we mustn't forget building use and building uses as we think about prevention through design. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully there'll be some useful uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Gibb, for another uh, excellent presentation. Thank you to Professor Hare.